So tonight we're going to do uh, the resurrection and possibly the greatest commandment if uh, time permits. So why don't we begin by reading um, Matthew. Let's read both sections just in case we get through them. So Matthew chapter 22, verse 35 through 22, verse 40. The same day, Sadducees came to him who said no resurrection, and they asked him a question, saying, Teach. Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, having no children, left his wife to his brother. So too the second and third died. After them all, the woman died. And the resurrection, therefore, to which of the seven will she be wife? They all had her. But Jesus answered them, you are wrong. Do you know neither the scriptures nor the power in God? For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they came together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So this is the second test of Jesus. The first one, remember, was by the Pharisees and the Herodians, which we discussed last week. And uh, about paying taxes to Caesar. So this is the second. You notice that there's sort of uh, what it, what is it called a tag team type thing? Is that like what you do in rest? Is that what it's called in wrestling? I think so. So there's a tag team. We have the Pharisees and the Herodians, both of whom presumably have nothing in common except that they are intent on getting Jesus. Now we have the, Fer the Sadducees who have nothing in common with the Pharisees, except that now they want to get Jesus too. And then in the final round, we'll have uh, the Pharisees back again asking uh, for, for what is the greatest commandment. This also is... Um, Looking backward, we've seen questions about the interpretations of about the interpretation of scripture and how scripture is to be interpreted. Does anyone offhand remember what those were? Let's start with the temptation in the wilderness. Remember the devil's mm -hmm. quote scripture. Mm -hmm. He just happens to quote the wrong scripture. 
Any, any, anything else? Another one is the transfiguration, right? They ask about Elijah coming. Where is Elijah? Mm. If they're interpreting uh, Malachi, is it Malachi? It's Micah. They're interpreting it literally. And Jesus is interpreting it uh, typologically. Elijah has already come because John the Baptist is a type of Elijah. Anything else? Divorce. Yes. Remember the uh, the uh, the Pharisees. Um, latch on to the bill of divorce as part of the Mosaic law. And Jesus says that it was a concession and just not the heart of God, which is that man and woman become one flesh. So we're again focusing on a literalism, focusing on what works for them and forgetting about the heart of God and God's intent. And then the final major one, does anyone remember what that is? The demand for a sign. Remember the, the, the Pharisees are viewing uh, all of the imagery of the day of the Lord very literally. So they're viewing the, the sun darkening or the moon darkening or the sun falling. They're, they're viewing all of those things as literal signs that have to come for the, the day of the Lord to be present. They're not present implicitly. It's Jesus isn't the Messiah and it's not the day of the Lord. But then the problem is that those are symbols. The real sign is that the, the uh, Messiah comes in a pure great idolatry, which is them. They're idolaters and they're the sign. So it's an understand, misunderstanding of biblical prophecy and uh, a focusing on signs that are really intended symbolic that aren't signs. So the next three conflicts, this one about the resurrection, the next one about the greatest commandment, and then uh, the final one about um, uh, or David's offspring, and uh, the Lord said to my Lord, are all, all center on the interpretation of Scripture. So we'll see how, how uh, Jesus does that. So the Sadducees uh, predominantly uh, a religious movement supported by the wealthy and powerful with very little popular support. So they include uh, many of the members of the Sanhedrin. They include the leading priestly families. They're really the people who control the temple establishment. Um, 
and they're theologically very just different from from the Pharisees. So the Pharisees believe in an oral tradition that subs that that supplements the uh, the uh, the Hebrew scriptures. The Sadducees don't, and not only they do they direct do, do they reject oral tradition, but they believe really only in the Torah. So five books of Moses are really the sum total of their Bible. So they reject the prophets. And then they reject, therefore, the supernatural. And they reject the existence of angels. Although they're in the Torah, not quite sure how they managed to do that. So are there any any questions? Thoughts? So then the debate is about the resurrection, resurrected, uh, resurrection of the dead. The, uh, the notion of resurrection of the dead is not a traditional Jewish belief. It basically first appears in Judaism roughly in about the second century before Christ. And uh, it appears in Daniel. In, uh, let's take a look at it in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who is charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, every one whose name be found written in the book. Any of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some everlast life, and some to shame and everlasting. So, so, <clears throat> so from the second century BC on, the uh, excuse me, second century, the um, the idea of a, of a Direction of the dead gained increasingly in Judaism, and uh, and especially in connection with the Maccabean martyrs. So the the there are all sorts of references resurrection with the, the, the Maccabean martyrs in in uh, the books of Maccabees. So the Pharisees accepted the resurrection and believed in the resurrection and the Sadducee did not, which in a famous encounter Paul used to his advantage. So the, uh, the, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees stoned him or turn him over to the authorities, I forget which. And, and he used the, the resurrection as, the issue of the resurrection as a, 
a uh, point of contention to divide them, which allowed him to uh, escape unscathed. So let's let's take a look at that. Acts uh, chapter 23, verse 6. Wait, which book was that? Acts. Oh, Acts. And Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God shall strike you, you whitewashed wall. We will see in the next chapter that Jesus calls the religious establishment whitewashed. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck. Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But when Paul perceived that one part was Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. With respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all. And then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended, We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel saw him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn in pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. So striking up dissension to escape. So the uh, so no resurrection. So that meant that all of the dead simply went to Shoal, which is really not so much hell as just the place where all the dead go. And so they believe that immortality is achieved by uh, your reputation and by what you pass on to posterity. So immortality is not gained through personal Bible and resurrection. Then underlying this also, the Pharisees tended to see God as, as distant and somewhat impersonal, not somewhat personal, very impersonal. And they tended to emphasize human free will. And so they objected to the notion of, of resurrection that because it was not found in the Torah. So you notice that there's a certain irony here that the Pharisees object to resurrection and don't believe in resurrection. And yet they're just, they're about to bring about Jesus' own death and resurrection. So the Pharisees um, believed in the resurrection, but they saw the resurrection and the kingdom of God as basically a simple return to present physical conditions. 
So when we're resurrected, let's come back to the way we were. Life will be basically the same, except that it'll have the good stuff and none of the bad stuff and suffering. But otherwise, it's the same. And then for the Pharisees, uh, Sadducees, rather, the Pharisaic view was really regarded as a caricature and a joke. So, I does everyone understand the, the thing about the uh, the wife marrying and her husband dying childless? So she marries the husband of the brother, and does everyone understand how that works? What it it's called uh, it's called leveret marriage. Does, does everyone understand why that is? Ron, uh, just a little bit, just before you go forward to that one, I am a little confused. Who believed in, re in resurrection? This The Pharisees. Ph Pharisees. In. And yeah. the Sadducees don't believe because don't. it's not in the Torah. Okay. Right, it's not in the Torah. Right, so mm -hmm. they think it's grotesque and a caricature and a joke. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so one lives on through one's one's heritage. If you're you're a Pharisee, through one's reputation, through one's you know observance of Torah, and through one's offspring and one's posterity. So, so if you're um, if you marry and don't have children and die, your line ends, right? And that means, you know, the end of all meaningfulness. That really, in some sense, means your death because you live on through your offspring. So, lover of marriage. Uh, provides a, a means for continuing a family line for a man who dies childless is that the second husband and the wife, the, the brother who marries the wife of the first husband has a baby and that child is the child of the first husband. Right? Is that clear? I mean, the whole thing is not clear, but I guess it's clear. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. good, Chinese. Okay, so let, let's let's start over then. So one lives on through one's offspring. One doesn't want to die. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to die. And yet you recognize, you know, that you die at some point. So you pass on yourself and your heritage through your offspring. So for that, you have to have children. So the basic problem is that if you marry and die without offspring, then you're dead. In, in the sense way that the Sadducees understood it. There's no more of your family line of your own personal one. So you die, you're forever gone. So lever would marry an attempt to circumvent that or prevent that from happening to the maximum degree. So, um, so if a man marries a woman, and he dies childless, then the, uh, the husband marries the wife, now his wife, and if they have a child together, 
that child is the son of the brother who died. Right? Yeah. Okay. So that means that the, the brother who died still can achieve immortality through his offspring. And it allows his name to continue in his and And the children of the marriage also continue to bear the name of the dead husband. You know, so if the dead husband is Peter and the second husband is Paul, the first, the child born of the marriage will be uh, Ben Peter, born of Peter, not born of Paul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the Pharisees also argue that if there were a resurrection, then levered marriage would not be found in uh, the Pentateuch. Actually, you know, I completely glossed over reading the, the statute about levered marriage. So why don't we do that? It's probably actually best that we discussed what it was first. Uh, it's Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. Is it there? Deuteronomy, cha Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. There you go. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his brother who is dead, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. And if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists saying, I do not wish to take her, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And the name of his house shall be called in Israel, the house of him that has his sandal pulled off. I mean, the sandal pulling off thing, what does that mean? I actually have no idea. I take it good. Yeah, that must be an insult of some sort, a bad one. Yeah. What if he doesn't have any brothers? Then I think his line dies. And actually, there are only two mentions of Leverett. There were only only two mentions of attempted levirate marriage in the Old Testament, one in Genesis and one in the book of Ruth. And in both cases, the marriage is resisted. Wait, which one is the one in the Genesis? Is that... Uh... Uh, it's... it's uh, there's Ur was married to Tamar, who was uh, Jacob's daughter. Jacob's 
sums um let me check i've totally forgotten who's who the father of Ur was. Oh, it's, it's Judah. So remember Tamar? She takes Judah into having sex with her. So this is, so Judah's first son is Ur. And E-R, and Ur died. And so Onan was supposed to marry Tamar, and he refused. That prompted Tamar, uh, you know, disguise herself and and uh, apparently be a prostitute, act as a prostitute, and entrap and entrap Judah. Hmm. So, so I'm sorry. Go ahead. That is only in case of death, right? Like, it's a, if a person was like, you know, like Abraham was married and they, they couldn't have a children. They couldn't have children uh, for a long time. That right. doesn't, like, your line is still going to die. Yeah, your line is still going to die if you, if line is going to die if you don't have any children and you don't have a brother. <coughs> Okay. Or you outlive your brother who then can't marry your wife. Or you die after your is menopause. Or either you or your wife are infertile and whatever. Um So, so the basic, so although, so the basic assumption here in, in so are, are there questions about uh, leverage marriage? Is that all clear? Just come up to mind, like how important your your, your offspring is. Uh huh. Right. You know, like right. it's very important. You try to keep it as much as you can. Uh huh. No offspring, you're dead. Offspring, yeah. you're alive. Mm -hmm. You survive through your offspring, which, in some ways, has its good side that they they knew that you can't take it with you. That shows a myth of wisdom. So basically, in in approaching Jesus, the the uh, Sadducees some of the assumptions as the Pharisees, so that if resurrection is possible, although it's not possible, but assuming you know for the sake of the argument that it is possible, it would basically involve a miraculous return to the conditions and the relationships of our earthly life. So it'll be our earthly life over again, except that it'll be bigger and better, and it'll have only the most pleasurable aspects of life on earth. So if there were a resurrection, it would be the resurrection of, of the Pharisees. So given that, the resurrected woman has to resume her marital relationship, right? But with whom is she going to resume relationship given that she now has seven husbands? So, the implication would be that the woman is destined to spend eternity with seven men at once, multiple husbands and one wife called polyandry. And uh, 
it's not acceptable in Jewish culture. And although it doesn't explicitly, nevertheless seems to violate the Torah. So the Sadducees have two goals here. One is that they want to, uh, ex so they know that Jesus believes in resurrection. So uh, the goal is to both expose the concept of resurrection as ridiculous and in getting him to answer the question about resurrection to make Jesus look completely foolish. So we'll see how well they succeed. So they address Jesus as teacher. If you notice, people who recognize Jesus in some form address him as Lord. And generally his opponents address him as teacher. So the Pharisees or the Sadducees would seem to be off to a, a not very good good start. And so so they're basing their belief on the Pentateuch, on, on the Torah, on the five books of Moses. And so their hope is that uh, in continuing to stress the resurrection, Jesus is going to ignore or to reject the Pentateuch or that he's going to incorrectly interpret the law and lever at marriage. It's also interesting here that, um, that in, um, that the, the Pharisees speak of resurrection here um, using a, a word meaning to raise up rather than um, rather than resurrection. So it's a choice of flex their, their belief that the production of an heir is the only resurrection supported by their theology. So how does Jesus respond? That they don't know how resurrection works. They don't know the scriptures and they don't know the power of God. So they're call it culpable ignorance. They're deliberately ignorant of the scriptures. And they don't know the power of God, so they have bad theology. And then Jesus focuses on them in reverse order. So remember, Jesus frequently accuses his opponents of not understanding the scriptures or asks, have you not read? And um, to support this notion of the resurrection, he reads, from, he quotes Exodus chapter three. Let's look at Exodus chapter three. Verses five and uh, five and fifteen to sixteen. Well, actually, let's read. Um, let's read from verse one of chapter three. 
this is a very good section of Exodus. <coughs> now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Then he said, do not come near, put off your shoes from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then again, jump to... Uh, chapter verse 13 then moses said to god if i come to the sons of israel and say to them the god of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me what is his name what shall i say to them god said to moses i am who i am and he said say this to the sons of israel i am has sent me to you god also said to moses say this to Israel, the Lord, the God of, of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So, how is that proof of the res? Well, first of all, well, okay. How is that proof of the resurrection? One argument is that um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive, have been resurrected, because the uh, the verb used is the present tense. But the problem is that in the Masoretic text, there's no verb, and so the sentence actually has no no explicit tense. So that argument isn't very convincing. So how else can, uh, why else, how else, how do we justify the resurrection from Jesus' use of Exodus chapter 3? Then any ideas? I have no idea, bro. <laughs> Okay, so in that passage, how does God first identify himself? I am. I am. So what does that mean? The... I 
I mean, I, I'm not sure about this, but I am looks like, you know, that is not past, that is not future. Is there like, I am, that is like, I don't know how to explain that. He's the one true God? Like he's, um, it's in a lot. Of, both of those are right, but it's also much more than that. It's that self-defining. God is. There's nothing else that needs to be added. God defines Himself, and. Uh, simply is. God isn't defined by anything. And so part of that being self-defining is that God defines his name, right? Or defines who he is. And so he initially defines himself as I am. And then after that, he defines himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and and uh, Jacob. Jacob. Right. And then in verses thirteen and through uh, through um, fifteen, is it? Yeah. Thirteen. Thirteen and four. Uh, thirteen and fifteen. Mm -hmm. uh, this is my forever. So the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob is his name forever. And thus, thus I am to be remembered through all generations. So he's self-defining and he the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were dead, then God would no longer be self-defining because he would have a dependence on the dead, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see that? And if he has a dependency on the dead Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the dead Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob must be greater than God. The logical absurdity. Is that is that clear? Is, is that murky? <laughs> Uh, one thing that I'm still not understanding is how that relates to the resurrection, like to the, yeah, to the resurrection. Well, if they're Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob died. Yeah. Physically. So if God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then they still have to be alive. Since they died, they have to have been resurrected to be alive or to exist as spiritual beings. Okay. Okay. So in some form, they continue to have to be alive. I mean, in some form, they continue to be alive is what Jesus is saying. But then you also said that in the language you don't have the tense. Right. Like... Right. So that's just simply the, 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 a really common argument is that so the, the, uh, the this is kind of in some sense this is somewhat obscure I mean, in the sense that um, 
at least especially for us, how Jesus sees proof of the resurrection in Exodus chapter 3 is not immediately clear. So one of the most <clears throat> common arguments is that he's basing his argument as of, of proof of the resurrection on the tense of the uh, sentence, I am, am the God, present tense of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And although there's the tense in the Septuagint, there's not a tense in the Masoretic text. And so Jesus would most likely have been familiar with the Masoretic text and not the Septuagint, which means that he would be aware of a sentence that didn't have an, a present tense verb. So that is very unlikely to be the reason for his argument. It's not the verb, it's the nature of God. That God is self-defining and has defined himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so since he's self-defining, they can't be dead or they would be greater than God. Also notice the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the uh, remember the 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 um, remember Isaac and Sarah was uh, sterile when she conceived. Right? She was an old woman. She was like a hundred years old or something and had long since passed menopause. So there was from viewpoint, I mean, when, when the angel informed them that she would have a son, she laughed, remember? So that all hints at Jesus' second point, which he does first before the, the scriptures that they don't understand the power of God that a woman who or a man and a woman who are dead in terms of not having a child nevertheless had a child. Um, Incidentally, that argument comes from Oregon, who argued that the immortal cannot define himself in terms of the mortal. Therefore, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not dead. God cannot claim to be the God of someone who no longer exists. Then there's also one additional argument that is compelling. It's that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Jewish culture uh, of Jesus' time was a standard formula that expressed God's presence, and especially his deliverance of his people. So since God can't but deliver his people completely, since he can't deliver his people partially, that has to mean that he does so in death as well as in life. So if the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a formula for God's deliverance of his people, then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob must be delivered and delivered if you're dead, and if they're dead, God hasn't delivered them, which would mean that God isn't a deliverer of his people, which is incomprehensible. So yet another implication of what Jesus is saying.
So questions about that? Does, does that make sense? Is that clear? Well, help a little bit. <laughs> Are there any questions about it? So then Jesus turns to uh, not knowing the power of God. So resurrection happens not because of our inherent immortality or the immortality of the human soul, but through the power of life of God that defeats death and sustains life despite appearances to the contrary. So the, power, the, the Pharisees assume that Resurrected life would be the same as existing life. And Jesus argues that by God's power, the resurrected life is a new life in some form. So it's continuous with the old. You know, it's the same person, that person is resurrected. But it's different and brings the old to, full, to fullness in some way that's unknown. So the manifestation of that in terms of the Pharisees' question is that people don't marry and marital relationship have no real meaning is marital relationships are for procreate and there's no need to procreate and in fact there's no ability to procreate either Pharisees don't know scripture they don't know the power of God and they see God as fundamentally distant and inactive. So questions about that? Yeah, that's, that's interesting to... Um... You know, help us understand the like the image of or the image of what heaven is really. Yeah, it's like it's nothing compared to what we see on Earth, right? It's, right. Well, there are two things. Like, there's there's heaven, and then there's where we're. Uh, purely spiritual beings. And then there's the new heaven and the new earth after the second coming where we have resurrected bodies. And, mm -hmm. and that will be, you know, that that's a, we can kind of imagine what being purely spirit is like, but it's, it's a mystery understanding what having a resurrected body will be like. It will be clearly very different. Uh, and, and in the resurrected place, everybody is going to be resurrected who is you know, accepted. And then there's also an argument about among the patristic fathers about how much of the animal kingdom will also appear in, in, uh, 
resurrected life. Since animals are fundamentally sinless, they simply are who God created them to be, and they're nevertheless life, life breathed into by God. God creates all life. So the um, the um, so the, the answers vary from they won't be there to you know some combination to they'll all be there also, but but the uh, but the, the big thing is that we have no idea and no real ability to conceive what that might be like, except that it's going to be different. So the idea is that in the resurrection um, creation, we'll be reunited to God as right. like, you know, uh -huh. as it was intended in the first right. place. Uh -huh. And we don't know what that was. And we don't, right, we don't know what that was or what that will be. Okay. No. So there won't be death, there won't be suffering, there won't be misery, there won't be injustice, there won't be inequality, there won't be hatred, there won't be, there won't be sin. There will be God and there will be sin, there will be whatever else there is. And it's a mystery. As well, it should be. So, any other questions or thoughts? Comments? Mm -hmm. um, so Jesus could have used other scriptures to make this somewhat easier, although they're all older. I mean, we, we read Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, uh, which was written late. The other uh, other scriptures that can be to point to the resurrection of the dead all were interpreted in terms of, of uh, the restoration of Israel or the regeneration of Israel, and then came to have a, a uh, either a messianic or an eschatological meaning in the course of the, the two centuries before Christ, and then into Christian history. So let's look at a few of those before we discuss why Jesus didn't use them. First is the heavenly banquet in Isaiah chapter 25, uh, verse 6. We've read this a whole number of times. And it's always good to reread it. It was one of the readings for Mass yesterday, but we didn't. Uh, there were three, a choice of three Old Testament readings, but we didn't read this one. We read from wisdom instead. Did you go to Mass yesterday? Like the. Uh... Oh, Soul State Mass? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. yeah I, I, All Souls Day is one of my my uh, four favorite masses of the year, along with Christmas and Easter and All Saints Day. The, either All Souls Day or All Saints Day, the sort of curtain that separates us from heaven is, is especially thin. And so often uh, you can get a real sense of your dead Esther's being alive, and and you can join with them together in celebrating Mass and, and worshiping God. So, I always find All Souls Day and All Saints Day Mass to be 
really, really powerful. It's a real, really powerful reminder of, you know, the fact that you come from a line of people of God who are with you. So, so, um, uh, yeah, I, I, very, very, very powerful. So chapter 25, verse 6, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of fat things, a feast of choice wines, fat things full of marrow of choice wines well refined. <clears throat> and he will destroy on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread mm -hmm. over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So that's one word. Another is Psalm 73, verses 24 and 25. Start at 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in you? And there is nothing upon earth that I desire besides you. So afterwards, you will receive me to glory. The same theme is echoed in the 49th Psalm, um, verse 15. And then also, do you remember, does everyone remember or know the dry bones in Ezekiel? I vaguely remember that. Yeah, there that, that could also be used, although the dry bones are a symbolic expression of the restoration of Israel. So with some other passages ready to hand that Jesus was aware of, why did he rely on Exodus? Because uh, the the wait a minute. Because the Sadducees uh, believe in the Torah. <coughs> they believe only in the Torah, and um, so they don't believe that the Psalms are part of the Bible. They don't believe that um, the prophets are part of the Bible. The so Jesus is arguing, trying to argue, even though he knows that their intent is hostile and that they're trying to trap him and make him look foolish. He, he knows that uh, they won't accept anything but the Torah. And so if he tries to argue from something other than the Torah, he'll look foolish and he'll basically necessarily lose the argument because by the terms of the question there's only the Torah. So it's a uh, a significant apologetical approach. We're going to study it in the apologetics class 
this week for precisely that reason. I think this was, what, Carmen, wasn't this one of the two things we were studying this week? I can't remember. I read I read your email, but I can't remember what, what the two things were. Uh, okay, one was the Good Samaritan. I think this was the second one. So, then the crowd is, expresses their amazement and the Pharisees are, these rather, are silenced. The word actually used is muzzled, which indicates that it's not that they didn't say anything, but that they couldn't say anything because there was really nothing for them to say. They had been prompt, uh, uh, thoroughly routed. So they had intended very much like the Herodians and the, uh, the Pharisees and the taxes to Caesar. They had, had uh, thought they were going to ri ridicule Jesus. The, their example, incidentally, is an absurd one with you know, seven husbands all dying marrying one woman and all dying childless. Um, so, you know, th th that itself is intended to poke, poke fun at him because this is an absurd example. Cole with resurrection is absurd. And, and so they're going to make him look foolish and absurd. And yet he manages to make them look absurd. So this is round of uh, the sparring contest with Jesus and, and round two of Jesus' victory. And the next one will be the greatest commandment. <laughs> 